Okay, the second lecture on micronutrients, we want to dive a little bit into the specifics of this. And to be perfectly honest, this um, lecture does not do justice to the vast topic on micronutrients. Um, but we really don't spend too much time on this um, because it's a course on soil fertility and not on plant nutrition or, you know, plant metabolism um, or mineral nutrition of plants. And so um, we give uh, a lot of information here. I'm going to go over it pretty quickly. Um, it's primarily to be used as a uh, reference. Um, you know, in terms of what you'll be responsible for, there will just be kind of generalities, but there's a, a lot of information here. And I've provided text just as, uh, you know, a reference that you that you all are welcome to, to go back and look upon um, as you progress through your career, right? So uh, there's uh, eight of these um, micronutrients, and we're gonna that are essential. And then there's other micronutrients um, that might be considered beneficial. And we'll start with with boron. Um, and boron again, this is a, a an, an anion that um, exists primarily. Uh, and cycled in this uh, organic form, um, so it's like sulfur nitrogen uh, cycled primarily through organic matter. Interestingly, um, a lot of these micronutrients, uh, are, as essential elements uh, to plants, are also essential elements to us. Boron, boron is not um, one of those. Boron is specific uh, for plants primarily functions in uh, the structure of plant cell walls um, but for us you know we we don't have a, a central need for for boron or for air animals in general okay so uh, boron deficiency in terms of the visual appearance is is relatively unique it pr produces this thick uh, disfigured and often dark green kind of um, uh, tissue you can see this cupping in the soybeans on the left and then in the corn you can see this kind of like disfigured kind of crinkled look that that occurs um, factors that are affecting that affect boron deficiency or boron availability uh, in general so availability de decreases with increasing pH okay so we're typically not going to see boron availability or, or deficiency with um, pH is less than six uh, but um, when we have low organic matter soil, uh, boron availability declines, okay? Um, and so there's other factors here, soil texture, uh, interactions with other elements, um, particularly calcium, okay? And uh, soil moisture and plant factors as well. These are tables that I'll show uh, with each micronutrient, uh, or nearly all of them. Um, it's just giving you some idea of sensitivity of different crops. Okay, so the last lecture we talked, I showed you some uh, tables that were all field crops here. This is more um, inclusive in terms of vegetables, specialty crops, uh, fruit crops, etc. But high, moderate, and low sensitivity, and depending on the crop that you're working with. Okay, so you can. You can look at those. I won't read all those to you now. Um, boron toxicity. Unfortunately, this is something that we see maybe, uh, um, or at least what crosses my plate, um, is people that have either as a granular or as a liquid application, as a pop-up or a starter application, applied micronutrient fertilization with seed that fertilization mix contains boron, could contain boron, and then we actually get a toxicity event that occurs, okay? And so this is something, uh, this is uh, cauliflower, I think, or maybe cabbage, and um, you can see this cupping that occurs at the leaves, and that is really a toxicity from um, a starter fertilizer treatment. So trying our best not to induce boron deficiency by applying a micronutrient um, mixes with seed, okay? Next element is copper. Um, copper primarily functions uh, uh, facilitating photosynthesis and respiration with transfer of electrons, okay? Uh, but also 
serves with ligand formation, cell walls, and carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. So it has a number of different functions. Um, <clears throat> copper deficiency, uh, primarily think of this in the context of grasses, uh, small grains in particular, but it's got this kind of curled tips um, that you know you can see pictured here. That would be kind of a um, more distinguishing feature of visual deficiency symptoms of copper. Factors that are affecting copper availability, uh, texture, pH, interactions with other nutrients and different plant factors. So texture, uh, as sandy soils, uh, coarse texture soils is where we're most often going to see copper deficiency. Um, so that's again a low organic matter situation. Um, as pH increases, uh, solution or copper availability decreases. Um, and then thinking about different plant factors, um, crops, uh, different crops can, like the genotype or the variety can be uh, very sensitive. So you might find, uh, geno like, grow two varieties of wheat, one you might find deficiency, one you don't, and, uh, the, you know, that could be from a genotype effect, and there's a number of different mechanisms listed here, okay. Copper sensitivity, uh, high, uh, moderate, and low sensitivity in terms of copper are listed here. And then on to manganese, okay. And so again, this is the nutrient that, that I indicated from our, our fact sheet that uh, this is where really the only documented um, case uh, with OSU uh, trials, it doesn't certainly doesn't mean it's the only micronutrient de that's deficient in Ohio, but it's the only one that we've we've got uh, documented evidence for. So manganese um, facilitates uh, photosynthesis, so this kind of facilitates electrons to oxygen um, in photosynthesis. Also with lignin synthesis um, can occur with manganese, okay. So these are um, actually pictures that I took because it's you know I've found patches of this in, in my time here I think I've the top two pictures are the ones I took I think the other ones from the internet but um, you know this is something that you you might encounter soybeans uh, new growth so um, you know this earlier growth and then it's what we've got this kind of classic dark green veins and then this intervenal chlorosis, so almost like a bleaching effect. You've got the vein, the, the veins of the that leaflet, and then just a, a, a total bleaching effect in soybeans. Okay, and again, uh, this is in corn. I haven't uh, seen this personally in corn, but um, you know, here's some some pictures. Um, manganese availability. Uh, Manganese is going, the availability is going to be driven strongly by pH, so high pH, low availability. Um, we also uh, think about manganese with excessive water, poor drainage, so kind of these uh, re oxidation reduction reactions that occur when soils turn anoxic or there's just excessive water, poor aeration, there's not a lot of um, oxygenation of that, so low redox potential. So. Um, Organic matter, again, uh, thinking about on high organic matter soils and, and interaction of organic matter and pH, high organic matter soils, high pH, we can see manganese deficiencies, okay? Other factors here, weather, interaction with other nutrients, and different plant factors. Crops that are sensitive to manganese deficiency, high, mild, and low sensitivity are listed here. Okay, uh, moving on to zinc. Okay, so um, zinc uh, is important and receives a lot of attention as it should because uh, lots of areas in the world have widespread zinc deficiencies. So zinc is a, is a micronutrient that can be fertilized more commonly than some macronutrients in some parts of the world. We go to um, the endogenic plains in uh, South Asia Vast stretches of Pakistan and Nepal and India might have soils that are uh, systematically deficient in zinc. And so 
Um, you know, this is a, a very big issue for lots of areas uh, of the world. Uh, in Ohio, um, not so much. We just haven't found a large, a lot of evidence that we do have a lot of zinc deficiency. Striping is uh, in corn. You know, when uh, where, what I'm familiar with is uh, zinc deficiency in corn. Probably the most common. Um, Micronutrient deficiency, uh, at least what, what I hear people talk about, zinc deficiency in corn, boron in corn. Um, those certainly are probably the two most commonly fertilized uh, uh, micronutrients for corn specifically, so zinc and boron. Uh, the striping that occurs is kind of classic symptoms, um, again, intervenal chlorosis. pH availability as zinc, as uh, zinc available availability decreases with increasing pH. So again, just like uh, manganese, um, as pH increases, our um, deficiency uh, decreases. So zinc is a cycle. It has a strong kind of organic matter cycling component. And so, um, you know, with low organic matter soils or low mineralization, we can often think about uh, having greater propensity for uh, zinc deficiency. Interactions with other nutrients, um, we think about this uh, primarily with phosphorus, but also uh, antagonistic relationships with um, copper and iron can occur. So, you know, as a, as a uh, plus two cation, um, but, uh, you know, again, over fertilization of phosphorus, we can find uh, zinc deficiency via antagonistic interactions uh, with uptake, okay? Other factors of flooding, climatic conditions, plant factors can exist as well. Okay, so uh, zinc sensitivity, uh, crops that are highly, mildly, or low uh, sensitivity to zinc. Okay, iron. Uh, I'm not aware of any place in Ohio that's ever documented iron deficiency, but again, doesn't mean that it might not exist. Um, iron deficiency... Um, uh, well, iron is absorbed by roots as kind of uh, F plus 2 and plus 3. And we think of it in terms of what it does in plants. It's a structural component of a number of these uh, uh, perf perfiring molecules. So I, I know about it, um, you know, these hemes or hematitin, leg hemoglobin, these are um, molecules that kind of uh, form these kind of like leaflet type of, um, you know, a central component with four different um, kind of petals to them that serve different functions in plants. For example, leg hemoglobin is this, you know, like our hemoglobin, leg hemoglobin is a, is a molecule that shuttles oxygen to rhizobia. Um, uh, so it, you know, functions in the same way as hemoglobin does in kind of our bodies, okay? So... Uh, toxicities can commonly occur in plants grown on acid or, or poorly drained soils. Um, iron deficiency showing a general bleaching of, of tissue and, you know, mostly intervenal chlorosis, but not having this uh, dark green veins like you might see with manganese deficiency. Um, <clears throat> factors that affect, uh, again, this is primarily through um, mineral cycling, you know, with the iron, and so we think of this as like these factors are primarily mineral in context of soil pH, water, and aeration, and the interaction with oxygen, how much organic matter um, is in the soil, etc. Crops that are sensitive to iron, that are mildly sensitive and tolerant to iron deficiency, listed here. Okay. Uh, chloride. Um, chloride, of course, a uh, common salt that we find. Uh, we receive a uh, atmospheric deposition of chloride. This is something that's monitored, um, you know, weekly in our National Atmospheric Deposition Program. And this is a map showing different deposition rates uh, of chloride depending on, you know, if you're, if you're by the ocean, not surprisingly, your deposition rates are higher on the coastal areas. Um, and they get lower as you get uh, closer inland. And so, um, 
Plant growing limited efficiencies are generally uh, rare in areas of significant atmospheric deposition. Okay. In terms of its function, um, you know, not surprisingly, uh, we learned about chloride in, say, you know, general bio or biochem, and thinking about uh, its function, you know, it's it's a kind of primarily with water regulation, osmotic balance, ionic charge. Um, it's transporters through um, membranes, uh, so kind of the analog would be potassium as a you know, as a you know positively charged monovalent cation. This is a negatively charged uh, monovalent anion, right? Um, so water regulation, cell turgid pressure, solute concentration, vacuoles. These are you know a number of different functions that uh, chloride plays in plants. Uh, I haven't seen this, but uh, you know some issues growing small grains and um, looking at this, uh, we've it's been described. You know, chloride deficiency been des described as uh, often being uh, um, misdiagnosed as a plant disease. This looks really like a foliar disease, like a rust or something that you might find on a small grain leaf, like. Um, a wheat or an oat, for example, but um, this is actually chloride deficiency. And so, um, oops, did I go the wrong way there? I did. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, moving on to molybdenum, okay, and molybdenum is, um, you know, unique <coughs> for a number of ways, but um, uh, we can think of it as um, <coughs> You know the function of plants; it forms this uh, molybdate and it forms um, different complexes. Uh, we can uh, what what I've heard of. You know, I I haven't heard too much of molybdenum, but thinking about um, there can be toxicity that occurs, especially with with forages and grazing animals. Okay, so uh, this is um, something to to kind of be aware of. Molybdenum is unique in Again, in the context is as pH increases, molybdenum availability increases. So uh, plants can get uh, forage crops, especially can get loaded with molybdenum, and that can be problematic for the, the livestock that graze. Okay. <clears throat> and then finally, our last micronutrient is nickel. Nickel is uh, has been a um, less micronutrient to be established 1987 so not too terribly long ago and it's really when um, our analytical instrumentation got sensitive enough to start detecting things at that low of concentrations okay um, uh, so um, some of the function of nickel in plants is still a little unclear um, but you know we can have again uh, too little or too much of it, and, and accumulation that can occur. Okay, um, nickel being a um, a waste product for a lot of kind of industrial applications, and can even think about you know heavy metal toxicity of nickel. Um, so that's got to be you know thinking about biosolids which come from municipal sources or industrial sources. And that transferring to plants and becoming toxic. So, um, plants all need nickel. All plants need nickel, but um, it's such low concentrations. It's not um, too terribly difficult to, you know, bioaccumulate these and to a toxic level. Okay. Okay. So, you know, very cursory um, handling of that. But let's talk a little bit about some beneficial elements. So cobalt is one of these things um, that we know is a essential element for um, some symbiotic microorganisms. So thinking about cobalt, it's not an essential element, but something that you know we want to pay attention to because of um, uh, growth and fixation of, uh, of you know some bacteria, right? So um, Sodium again is uh, not an essential um, element for all plants, but there are some plants that that do require it. Um, C4 plants; these are plants that typically grow in kind of warm and water 
limiting environments and so they might require uh, some sodium for managing water relations that's kind of an, an evolved uh, property over time silicon um, has uh, been you know reported as a beneficial nutrient for um, think of this primarily for kind of plant disease resistance greater uh, stalk strength etc uh, not an essential element, but a beneficial element. And then finally, selenium, um, not an essential element for plants, but is for animals. And so sometimes, uh, for example, pastures, primarily uh, for what I've heard of it anyways for sheep, grazing sheep, where uh, there'll, there'll be selenium fertilization in plants. Um, and then that will increase the selenium concentration in that forage and, you know, be translated into the, that, that ruminant. So, um, and then finally, vanadium, uh, low concentrations um, are beneficial for microorganisms and some plants. Um, vanadium can be substituted uh, from, um, from molybdenum for nitrogen fixation for rhizobia. But this is, you know, again, uh, an element that occurs in incredibly low concentrations. And, um, you know, admittedly, because of the fact that the concentration is so low, a lot of times, you know, we might not have a full understanding of what all these micronutrients do, okay? So, you know, again, that's a very um, whirlwind tour. We could spend a lot, lot longer on a lot of this, but we just, um, you know, don't really want to focus on it too much and uh, we've got a lot of other things that we want to talk about throughout the semester so you know we we don't spend a lot of time for this course on micronutrients um, kind of take home messages in terms of thinking about what uh, you know how to manage for this if you suspect micronutrient deficiency you know one of the best ways that we can uh, increase uh, micronutrient you know, we can, of, of course, always fertilize either, and that's a broadcast soil or more commonly, say, foliar applications. But um, organic matter is a great way to, uh, to increase micronutrient availability. And so thinking about a manure application or a biosolid application, a compost application, you know, if you've got availability to a, a sources of manure or compost, um, uh, those are things that you know have number of added benefits in terms of the organic matter in that, but also are very very good sources of micronutrients and sustain micronutrient availability. So, I I tell growers um, a lot of times if they're really concerned, uh, you know, we can do field trials uh, to to test to see if fertilization makes makes an impact. Um, oftentimes, you know, those just don't kind of bear fruit. Um, but you know, uh, an, an application of a you know of an organic amendment of a manure or compost um, manure can of course be much cheaper than say a compost, but that can do a lot in terms of providing you know a rich source of nutrients. Um, so uh, this is an area I think maybe you know one of the reasons that. I don't particularly spend that much time on it is that there's just a lot of uncertainty that surrounds uh, micronutrients and, and maybe uh, there's good reason for that um, maybe because you know um, for our Ohio soils they're they're not uh, particularly a, a major production constraint um, but you know there's a lot of of course biochemistry that that occurs and these are again are essential nutrients and so plants need them uh, are they getting in them in all the right quantities? Uh, well, you know, we suppose so, but it's pretty difficult to really know that with absolute certainty. So, um, anyways, uh, I'll end there and say, uh, you know, there's plenty of other resources out there. There's entire textbooks, of course, devoted to micronutrients. So, um, this, again, is just a, a very brief overview.